Hello and welcome to chapter 3 for B201. This is our last of the review chapters. In this chapter we're going to review energy, catalysis, and biosynthesis. So in this lecture, it's going to be one lecture. This is the last one before we have it broken up into pieces. And we're going to talk about how cells are using energy, how en enzymes and how they work. And just a quick review, we're going to talk about enzymes a lot throughout this entire semester. So we're just going to do a quick review this time. Properties of energy and then biosynthesis. As always, here's your chapter objectives. Make sure that you have a good handle on these before our next test. Um, make sure you understand KM and Vmax. That's maybe a new concept for you that you haven't heard before. Um, and we'll talk about it in this lecture, but I want to make sure you have a good handle on that. And just let me know if you have any problems with these objectives, if you'd like to go over them or anything like that. So now let's get started. So first of all, we're going to talk about how cells use energy. This is critical because if cells can't use energy, they can't perform any of the functions we're going to talk about for the rest of the semester. So first of all, let's talk about um, catabolic and anabolic pathways. Remember, from 201 or any of your other classes you've talked about this, catabolic are the pathways that break down molecules. So this is what happens when you digest food. When you're digesting food, usable forms of energy are removed, as well as the building blocks are harvested to be used for other things. And something that always happens when this process occurs is that heat is lost to the environment. This is why sometimes you get hot and things like that. That's partially what's happen happening is with the heat is that it's the um, these processes occurring. Anabolic processes build. So they take those building blocks, they take that usable form of energy, and they put them together into new molecules that the cells need. So if we're going to be building a new cell wall, for instance, or we're getting ready to undergo division, need to make a new mitochondria. That's where all this is coming from, is from those building blocks and from the energy that's released during the catabolic processes. Together, these make up the metabolic processes of the body. So make sure that you understand which one's which and how they work. And we'll talk a lot about them in other aspects when we talk about respiration and all that goodness later, but make sure you understand the big deal, the big differences here. And so remember, A, B, C, D, anabolic builds, catabolic destroys. Now as much as may, we may want to try to get away from it, physics, we can't escape physics. All of life is bound to the laws of thermodynamics. And there are two main laws that we are concerned with in biology. The first of these laws is the first law of thermodynamics, which is that energy cannot be created or destroyed, it is only transformed. All energy in our biosphere on the planet Earth is in a circular, um, it's in a cycle, in that it is not created or destroyed, it's just transformed. Generally, it leaves our system as heat, and it only can come into our system through solar energy. And we'll talk about that when we talk about photosynthesis, and we're going to review that real quick on the next slide. But the second law of thermodynamics that's really important is that systems will move towards a state of disorder, or entropy, which is... Um, sometimes called chaos, etc. Um, but it's disorder. And so how does that make sense? You know, we think about that a lot with all of our cells, our bodies, everything our body does is try to make more order. So how is it possible that our bodies and the rest of biology can observe both of these laws of thermodynamics? So what happens is by using the first law, we balance out the second law. So by, make, by transforming some energy into heat, and that goes out into the environment, creates more entropy, more disorder, then the cells can go ahead and balance that by making more order within the cell. So make sure you understand how the first and second laws work together and what they mean in terms of the cellular function. And as I mentioned, where the energy all starts from the sun. The sun comes in, it is captured by plants or other photosynthetic an, um, animal or it's captured by plants or other photosynthetic organisms and it is transformed into a, a usable energy for the other organisms on the plant that can't photosynthesize. And during this process there is some heat that is lost. It's also when they're digested in other organisms the heat is lost and so that's how it's working. Remember that this is a cycle of energy, it's a cycle of carbon. There's a lot of processes that come together and we're going to talk about this a lot over and over again this semester, but it's really important that you understand that this is how the energy comes in and leaves our system. So how is energy stored? And I've referenced this, but it's really important that you understand this. And if you're not feeling super confident in redox, 
go ahead and watch some of those videos I've uploaded to Blackboard as a refresher on Redox. But basically the key is that energy is stored in bonds, either in the active en activated er energy carriers, which we're going to talk about at the end of this lecture, or in sugars or in lipids, but it's stored in the bonds. And as these bonds are broken, the energy is released. And this creates that nutrient cycle that we've been talking about, the carbon cycle, etc. So make sure you understand how that works and how redox in the general sense, I'm not expecting you to have the full chemistry breakdown, but I do want you to understand the basics of it so that you can understand how we apply it to biology. So now we're going to overview real quick how enzymes, um, what they are and how they work. So basically what's an enzyme? If you took your 201 recently, you probably remember the definition that's hammered into you is that it, um, an enzyme is something that speeds up a reaction without being consumed by the reaction. And that's basically true. What it does is an enzyme will help lower the activation barrier. Now how does it do this? It does this by causing a conformational change in that substrate, so the molecule A in this picture. Causes it to change some way in which the energy needed to cause the reaction to occur is now lessened. It is oh, enzymes are always very, very specific, and they will only react with specific molecules. So make sure you understand that an enzyme is very rarely very broad. They usually only act on very, very specific things. So let's look a little bit about how they um, how they lower the activation energy. So you can see here, and this is a classic drawing of activation energy. So what you see is this big hump and Y has to get over this hump to become X. Well, it's highly unlikely that's going to happen because that's a lot of energy that would need to go into the system. So what happens instead is that enzymes help change Y to an extent so that that hump is lessened, which means that less energy has to go into the system to produce X. And so that is how the enzyme works. And so lowering that, um, that activation barrier is what allows these reactions to occur. Now, if they have a low activation barrier, known as a negative delta G, these can be a spontaneous reaction. That doesn't mean it happens fast, it doesn't mean it happens quick, um, immediately, but what it does do is that it, it just can happen on its own. It doesn't need any input, and that's a minus delta G. A positive delta G is something that needs energy put into the system, and we'll go through that here in just a little bit. Make sure you understand that delta G, because delta G is free energy. Now we have two important variables that go into enzymes, how we measure enzymes, and it's Km and Vmax. And it's really important that you have a good handle on how these variables work, so let's go through those now. So the first one of these variables is Vmax. What Vmax means is that when all of the receptors on the enzymes are bound, we are at Vmax. This is the fastest the reaction can go. If you remember from 201 when you did the yeast lab, the, it didn't matter how much if how much sugar we added after a certain point because the enzyme sites were all filled and so the reaction was going to occur only as fast as the enzymes could turn over the reaction at that point in time. That's what Vmax is. Vmax is the maximum speed when all substrates or when all active sites on the enzymes are bound by substrate. Now the other aspect of it is Km, and Km is a measurement we use to help us determine Vmax and help work out the Michaelis-Menten equations, and Km is the value that is, um, is reached when one half of all the sites are filled. So Km is when we are at one half Vmax. Now this seems weird because why wouldn't it just be one half Vmax? Well what happens is that there is this escalating um, curve that happens when enzymes or when enzymes bind substrate and so there'll be a quick upbeat and then it'll take a while to reach Vmax and so what we can do is by using Km we can help calculate what we need to get to Vmax to reach saturation or saturation because the curve will level off to an extent at the top so that helps us find that exponential area so that we can better formulate that so make sure you understand that that Vmax is the maximum rate that the enzyme or the Vmax is when all sites are filled and that that's the maximum rate of turnover. Basically that is as fast as the enzymes can work and we are completely bound by that point how specific and how tightly bound the enzyme is to the substrate. Km is one half of Vmax. This is how much substrate it takes us to get to one half of the maximum rate of the enzyme. So now let's talk a little bit about properties of energy. This is the last little stop we have on this PowerPoint. So first of all, I've already talked about this once, but let's talk about free energy. Free energy is delta G. 
This just means it's the essential amount of heat generated by the system. If delta G is a positive number, the reaction is unlikely to occur because it will be creating more order in the system and will violate the second law of thermodynamics. And so this is important because the reaction will need, usually need external energy, such as that provided by ATP. And so this is where ATP comes into play. When a system has negative delta, delta G, it is likely to proceed on its own and create more disorder. This is why when you have a stack of like bricks, there's, and the higher it gets, the more likely it is to fall over. That's because it has minus, a negative delta G. However, one brick laying on the ground is unlikely to fall over because its delta G is positive. And so that's how this works with the free energy. And so just remember that delta G equals free energy. If it's negative, it's energetically favorable. If it's positive, we're going to have to put energy into the system. So not all reactions can be favorable reactions. This makes sense, right? Most of the stuff in our, in our cells want to de uh, decrease the disorder, which means that we would need more energy to drive that. So what cells do is they create coupled reactions. They have a reaction that is a negative delta G that they can use to help offset a positive delta G reaction. And I know this image here on the side is not super clear because it's just it's just an infographic essentially, but it helps get the point across in that we use the transformation of C to D to help generate the transformation of X to Y. Think about this as an extent is that, um, to an extent, is how we do some of our respiration cycles. And we're going to talk a lot about these when we get to that chapter in this, in this text. Um, but just be familiar with that and that the cells will use coupled reactions to help drive these. So activated energy carriers. There's a whole bunch in the cell, but the ones that I want you to focus on right now are ATP, NADH, and NADPH. And as I said, there's some other ones, but I'm not too worried about them. They'll just show up occasionally as we go through things um, this semester. But ATP, NADH, and NADPH are the important ones. So what do these activated carriers do? They simply carry the energy from one reaction to another. This is how the cell couples those reactions. It moves from the energy from an energy fav energetically favorable reaction, such as breaking down food, creating more disorder, shuttles that energy over to an energetically unfavorable reaction, such as creating um, a new lipid membrane. And so that's how this works. It shuttles between catabolism and anabolism, creating the circle or the cycles of metabolism. So let's look through a few of these now. The first one is ATP. ATP stands for adenosine triphosphate. That means that we have an adenosine molecule, just like the one you find in the nucleic acids, and three phosphates on them. And so what happens here is we remove phosphates and that allows reactions to occur. And you can see that in this picture here from this um, reaction. You can see how we're going from glutamic acid and moving to glutamine and how that requires the activation step and the condensation step and it requires the input of um, ATP into it. So by removing the phosphate from ATP, adding it onto the high energy intermediate, it is then going to go downhill in the energy needs to allow for the formation of glutamine. So that's how ATP works, is we knock off a, a phosphate, add it to an intermediate. That intermediate doesn't like having it there because of the energy demands. It falls off and that's how the step occurs. And you know, we don't usually show these intermediate steps. We usually just show this ATP to ADP in the final product. But it's important to understand how that works. NADH and NADPH are electron carriers. So they're slightly different, whereas ATP is carrying the energy in the bonds in the phosphates, NADH and NADP are bringing those electrons in that allow for redox reactions to occur. They can carry, um, those electrons can also be sometimes be called hydride ions, there's a lot of different things, but it's important to understand that these electron shuttling is what then helps drive the, um, the, the reactions. We're going to talk a lot about this in chapter 13 with photosynthesis and metabolism, and you probably have heard them before but just be familiar with them um, for now. Just be able to recognize them and understand what they do. So lastly, we're going to do biosynthesis, and we only have a few slides on this, so just hold on. You can make it. So first of all, what is biosynthesis? Biosynthesis is the creation of new macromolecules in the body, and it's important that we remember that this is where we really need to balance out the second law of thermodynamics. 
Biosynthesis is not energetically favorable by any means. We have to liberate energy from somewhere else and apply it to biosynthesis in order for these reactions to occur. Most often we use ATP, sometimes we use GTP, which is guanine triphosphate, but for our purposes you can think of them as the same thing. And it, it helps transform these reactions by removing phosphates from ATP or GTP, transferring them to intermediates, and allowing those intermediates to be built through that process. But sometimes we have to go even farther than just one. And you can see that here on this slide, is that we have to use intermediates to help us get there. And look at how complicated this can get. We, not, we can knock off one phosphate or we can knock off two phosphates. We can do it in a series. It just depends on how we want it to go. So it's really important you understand that the shuttling of energy is occurring all over the place in our cells to help drive these unfavorable reactions. So make sure you understand that it's not always just as simple as the slide before and that in this case we have a lot of different shuttling going on of those intermediates. So make sure you understand that and if you have any questions about this let me know um, and make sure you review those objectives and if you have any questions as I said this chapter should be reviewed but if you haven't had physics which is not a pre-requirement for this class let me know and we'll go through this stuff a little bit more in depth.